when we think about all the cool technology that's available in the world and all of the ways that technology is used for access, sometimes technology for people with disabilities is considered very differently. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. At the University of Washington Center for Research and Education on Accessible Technology and Experiences, or CREATE, they are focusing on high-impact projects, working towards a world with fewer problems and more solutions for people with disabilities. We are joined by Jennifer Mankoff, the Richard E. Ladner Professor at the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, and Heather Feldner, Assistant Professor and Physical Therapist within the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, who collaborate at UW CREATE. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. What is CREATE at the University of Washington? CREATE is the Center for Research and Education in Accessible Technology and Experiences. And we are a research-oriented center that also works to do translational work and education um, around accessible technology. Our mission is to make technology accessible and to make the world more accessible through technology. So I know there's a lot of kind of interdisciplinary parts here. How did the group come together and has it been difficult getting buy-in from different peers? Yeah, so so CREATE was founded by nine faculty from the College of Engineering, including mechanical engineering and computer science and human-centered design and engineering from the iSchool. And then Heather is from disability studies and rehab technology and uh, rehab medicine, I should say, sorry. Um, and we, I think that um, UW has a history of these really great interdisciplinary centers. For example, the Dub Center Design News Build has faculty from all across the university who do HCI research and related topics. And so it's a place that fosters and supports this kind of this interdisciplinarity. And I think it's part of what is a strength of the center because the uh, excellent accessibility research happening across all of these units was part of what made it exciting for folks to support us. And I should say that our, our founding uh, partner was Microsoft, but we've already diversified our funding to include NIDLER and other groups that uh, the actual some of the departments have been funding us. So we've, we've been getting support from a wide variety of sources. Yeah, I wouldn't think it was too difficult to get big, uh, like corporate entities interested. <laughs> And I would just add, too, that I think what was so neat about it, you know, in thinking about how you phrased that question, you know, was it challenging to get buy-in? Um, I think it was the exact opposite. I think it was really awesome <laughs> to have all of these people who were so excited and invested in these different aspects of accessibility work to come together and say, you know, we have something really special here. And so it's almost like that buy-in was already there. And then it's like, what can we do together to amplify that and make it make it happen on a broader scale um, and really start to look at these new collaborations? So it was really, it was exciting. You've talked about what the biggest or set up what the biggest objective is, but kind of what are your, your long-term goals across the team? It's been just amazing to see the variety of work that's being done, but some of the central things that we're trying to do are, you know, first of all, we are not the only accessibility center on campus. So we're trying to amplify and support the amazing accessibility work that's also happening outside of CREATE. Um, secondly, we are trying to be a home for uh, researchers with disabilities. So about 50% of CREATE um, includes students and faculty, including students and faculty identify as disabled. Um, and then third, we are trying to make sure that the work we do has real world impact. So we try to um, emphasize translational aspects of what we're doing and support that. For example, CREATE has a really active community partners program as well as an industry affiliates program that provide opportunities for um, early stage engagement, but also dissemination, for example. That doesn't answer it from a research perspective. So I'm gonna let Heather take that as the first answer because she is um, helping or running one of the moonshot projects in CREATE. You know, when I think about, you know, long-term goals and long-term impact, right, The the idea is to move the needle more um, uh, when it comes to access, right? And that could be access to mobility. That could be access to digital technologies. And so I think what is neat about what we're doing at Create is we're, we're bringing people together from different angles and, and different backgrounds. But the, the goal is, is the same, to ask who does and doesn't have a, a voice or a position at the table, right? Who does and doesn't have access 
to these different types of, of enabling technologies? And what can we do to uh, accelerate that, right? How, what can we do to get solutions um, to uh, out into the world and really make sure that we're answering research questions that are driven by the communities in which we work, right? And so what's, what are the priorities um, of families and kids, in my case, um, kids with disabilities? Um, in many others' cases, folks who are in the in the job market or or in a certain employment situation that need access to do their work um, appropriately like what from their perspectives are the priorities and how can we help facilitate or changing the way that that something is kind of considered when it comes to technology in society right um, because when we think about all the cool technology that's available in the world and all of the ways that technology is used for access, sometimes technology for people with disabilities is considered very differently than than mainstream technology, right? And and why is that? And and should that be the case? And and what can we do to kind of help switch the narrative there? Heather's work, which I'm sure she'll have more to say about, but is asking, why is it that kids who are super young, like would just be ambulating, right, are not given access to mobility technologies when they can't do that on their own. And how would that change the way those children develop communication skills, motor skills, and so on? Yeah, so um, that that's a great um, example. So we're working with um, kids in the one to three-year-old range um, with with different disabilities. And, you know, what we're seeing is that um, kids are learning all the time, right? They're learning by right. their interaction with with their caregivers and with people in their family and with peers and, and friends. They're also look, learning by exploring the space, right? And so if we can um, augment uh, a, a child's capability to explore space, they learn about themselves. They learn about their bodies. They learn cause and effect. If I touch this switch or this joystick, I, um, I move. And maybe that will take me someplace and or maybe I will just spin in circles and that's fun. Um, right. And so um, we're really seeing these cool, not only developmental changes, but we're seeing changes in communication. We're, ch we're seeing changes in how kids and families interact. You know, parents are interacting with their kids differently when they're mobile versus when they're stationary. Um, and and I think that has real world impact in, in terms of um, thinking about capability and also thinking about how we can design technology and and make sure it gets into the hands of kids and families in a way that is different from kind of the status quo, which there's a lot of challenges wrapped up in that, as you can imagine. And I, I think that sets me up to ask you about a project that uh, we funded that you worked on a little later called Go Baby Go. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Go Baby Go is a mobility and socialization project that really focuses on providing technology to augment children's early mobility. So um, kids with disabilities may be working on certain developmental or motor skills um, in, in therapies with their families. Um, but in the meantime, how can we kind of capitalize on other ways that kids can explore their environments that really takes these everyday ubiquitous off the shelf toy vehicle. Um, and we make some just really basic accessibility modifications. We'll put in an accessible switch that a child can activate with their head or their hands or their knee or um, something like that. Um, we'll put in some seating supports that are, are kind of custom made to support whatever that child's postural needs might be. Um, and then we kind of get out of their way um, and, and we let the kids explore and um, f sometimes for the first time experience movement on their own that they're in control of. And it's, you know, it's definitely a, a, a temporary solution. It's not meant to be a permanent, permanent solution, but I think it, you know, draws attention to the fact that there's a real lack of technology support for this, yeah. this age group. You guys mentioned consideration and... I was thinking for people that don't necessarily consider accessibility, what is the greatest misunderstanding about disability among the general public? That it's a stigma only. 
there's something joyful about being part of the disability community and the access it gives you to rights and uh, mutual support and opportunities to think creatively about how you engage with the world and um, and to you know be proud and centered in who you are, whatever that is. And and that it doesn't mean you can't live life to its fullest. It's just part of who you are, like the color of your hair or the relationship you're in or anything else. You know, one of the things that I think is really common in society is to think of disability as this inherently bad and sad thing that resides within an individual body or mind. Um, but we know if that in the right communities and in the right supports, with the right supports, that someone's body or mind is is not the problem, right? It, it's this, it's the barriers that have been built into our society. It's it's the attitudes of people um, that prevent full participation and then that lead to kind of that discrimination. And so, um, you know, that kind of medicalized view of disability, I think, is. Um, is something that we can continue to push back on. Yeah, just by our not thinking about it or not acknowledging it in that kind of way. Well, and not building for it, right? I mean, in a world where everybody uses technology every day, just about if those technologies aren't designed with access in mind, they are creating inequities that are unnecessary. Um, And that's why a center like Create has such a diverse body of research, because there are so many ways in which technology engages with us. And and we need to constantly be asking, what are we missing? So this example of like early childhood is a space where there wasn't necessarily enough happening in, in mobility until some of the kind of work Heather's engaged in came along. You know, another initiative that we're looking at is how we can make sure that disability work isn't defaulting to whiteness, but is actually thinking broadly about the variety of people out there who have disabilities who, you know, exist in every space and place and skin color and sexuality and like all of the variety of humans is also the variety of disability and our work should engage with that or asking, you know, how can we change the data that's out there? So how do we make AI more inclusive? How do we ensure that when we're dealing with transportation and sidewalks and navigation, that we know about the needs of people with disabilities and the data sets that we're collecting. And that's a very, very large project slash initiative space for a couple of create faculty and so on and so forth, even down to what we manufacture, our manufacturing processes and our ability to customize everything from knitted garments to, you know, 3D printed things to meet the needs of individuals with disabilities and their unique needs and to do it in a way that you know, gives them um, an equal part in society. Yeah, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about is kind of challenges with design, because I know you've you've talked a lot about uh, using 3D printing for things such as I think there's a video on YouTube where you're talking about a child's uh, cello holder that had some Legos involved to like kind of figure out how to customize the thing. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges that I've been really trying to think about with design, I mean, that was obviously, you know, just looking at creative means to do rapid iterative design in a space where it can be slow to 3D print something, much less to, you know, create a whole new product line is almost an impossible task often when the number of people who need the specific variation, right, which is just sort of a facet of disability is how how heterogeneous or sort of variable the experience of even the same diagnostic condition is. And so, and and we shouldn't define disability anyway in terms of diagnosis, right? And so, so the ability to customize is really important. But I, I just want to add to that, that what we also need to see is that we're putting the means of, of customization, production, and so on. First of all, yes, everyone who's making products should be making accessible products, right? But also we should make sure that people with disabilities can use all of these tools, both because if we don't have them in in the workforce, we're missing an important part of the workforce. We're missing an important set of perspectives, but also because if you're customizing things, maybe you want to have some control over that, right? And so I think that's where we need to see things go. And if you, I think if you look at who has traditionally been the designer, (laughs) Um, right? It it has been, you know, from this kind of uh, certainly non-disabled, you know, often, you know, white male designer, right? Um, And if you look at who our society is, right, like one in four people in the U.S. 
have a disability of some sort, right? And so where is the representation of of people with disabilities, of people of color, of people with all of those intersectional um, identities that have been traditionally marginalized in our society, right? And 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 so, um, you know, when I think about a design issue, I think about you know who who is who has the privilege of being at that table, um, of sharing their lived experiences, of being a part of that community themselves, and saying you know here's a direction where we can take design that will be more inclusive. So some of those tools should be put in the hands of people who don't have to have all of that training. But if we want to also change who's in the driver's seat with these kinds of design efforts, we need to also make sure that higher education, programming tools, design tools, all of that also includes people with disabilities. And we have a lot of work to do there. And I wanted to ask you both about how you're seeing technology impact this field. Like how is AI and machine learning, for example, working in your favor or against you as you try to push ahead? Yeah, just because, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a wonderful group of students that I work with, many of whom identify as disabled. And because of the particular um, events of recent months with the the arrival of chat GPT and other things, our group realized that this is exactly a question we need to tackle. And so we've been actually doing a sort of auto ethnographic project for the last couple of months where we're all trying to use, you know, mid journey, chat GPT, all sorts of different tools to solve our own accessibility needs to see what we can learn about, you know, and, and not only that, we have people in the group who are not disabled as well. And so, so we're asking three questions. One, if you generate something with AI, is that thing accessible? Two, if you have an accessibility need, what kinds of accessibility needs is AI today able to help address and which kinds is it not able to help address? And then three, is AI ableist? Is the language it uses, are the, the phrases or the pictures it generates ableist? And we think that, that it's important to look at all three of those things in order to really assess where we need to engage with this. Um, and, you know, we already know that even before we started looking at this, that there's all sorts of problems with the kind of data that goes into AI, right? That that um, there are AI systems that essentially erase the existence of people with disabilities, right? And, and potentially with very harmful effects because they just don't see somebody who is short or, you know, looks different in unexpected ways or doesn't type at a speed that is required by a security system to log in in time. Or, and there's a sort of an endless number of these kinds of examples. And I would say from from my standpoint, you know, um, I, I I wish that we were more at the point of having conversations in and around the mobility technology space, um, thinking about how AI or machine learning might, you know, advance our, our designs and our integrations and such. And, and I think some of those conversations are starting in the adult world. But, you know, from a pediatric standpoint, I think one of the biggest things in, in considering technology is that we are at a crossroads of opportunity, right? We have had very little innovation in pediatric mobility technology in particular, right? Um, there are some options in, in, in other countries, but in the U.S., there are go baby go cars, which are a temporary kind of stopgap do-it-yourself solution. Um, and there is one currently FDA cleared device, the Permobile Explorer Mini, that is designed specifically for kids in the 12 to 36 month age range, right? That one to three year age range. That's a problem, right? To have one solution. Um, and, and so I really think that we're at a crossroads of opportunity in terms of taking some of this research data that we've been collecting with some of these, these de devices that are designed for this kind of uh, what, what has been called early power mobility, but I, I call it on time power mobility, um, it, it really gives us an opportunity to say, okay, where's our next design innovation? How can we um, not only improve the technology um, that's available for this, this, this age group, but how do we improve access to those technologies um, for, for a broader range of kids? Um, and I think it brings into all of those same kind of questions about equity that that Jen mentioned. Um, but to continue to push against those barriers and to continue to create solutions that um, that really kind of help sustain that 
that right to mobility, that right to exploration that um, that we know kids without disabilities have. Um, that's where I'm excited to see this 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 line of of technology work headed in the future, at least for you know in the in this in this kind of niche that I'm in. Special thanks to Heather Feldner and Jennifer Mankoff. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Podker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.